The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Good morning and welcome to the Capitol Hill Presbyterian Church. My name is Pastor Rachel Vognis and it is a great pleasure for me and all who are here leading in worship to welcome you to worship this morning. A special word of welcome if you are here with us for the first time. Uh, we invite you to use the order of service in the bulletin as a guide throughout the service. Um, it has our hymn selections and our readings. And in the back, for everybody, it has our announcements, um, some of which I will highlight. Um, this morning, we welcome Pastor Mark, who was the Gap Pastor at CHPC for nine months this last year. And uh, he told me he was never in person in worship during that time. Um, so we are very, very happy to have you, sir, uh, here sharing in worship. And um, we hope that you guys can all make it to the picnic after church in the courtyard, where there will be a chance to get to meet Pastor Mark in person. And uh, we will celebrate him there. Um, if you did not RSVP for the picnic, that is okay. It's bring your own food, but I believe that there are cupcakes and other refreshments that are available to you if you um, are just coming last minute. Also, for those of you who are virtual, welcome. We invite you to say who you are in the chat so that we can know who's worshiping with us this morning. And if you have any prayer requests, we invite you to send those in via text um, on the YouTube, the YouTube, uh, early so that we can make sure to have them included in our joys and concerns. So we are glad that you are with us as well. Finally, um, there are instructions on how to give. We are not collecting a, uh, we're not passing the plate for our offerings, but there are other ways for you to give, including texting CHPC offerings to 73256, and the instructions are here in one of the last pages, and I invite you to check that out. It's not only easy, it's a little bit fun. Are there any other announcements? Yes, Brandon. Uh, there are burritos that are being made. Um, that is breakfast burritos. It's one of the ministries of the church, one of the feeding ministries. And that is happening just in between uh, after the service, before the festivities. So thank you, Brandon. That will be directly downstairs. Yes, Missy. All right, so yes, there'll be plenty of time to get food, and, um, you, you, and it's going to be a wonderful time. Uh, so now, those are all of the uh, announcements to highlight. I would like to uh, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Join me in the call to worship. The law of the Lord is perfect reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making the wise the simple. More to be desired than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let us worship God. say we have no sin. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
Let us confess our sins together in hope. Eternal Eternal God, our judge and redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will and obey your commandments. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May the God of mercy, who forgives us all our sins, strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. I'd like to invite any boys and girls who are here to come forward for the time with children. We can take our time because there's kiddos coming from all over. And families, if you you don't know, there is also a family room upstairs. You do not need to go there. Children are welcome at all, in all places in the worship service. Um, And we invite you to, to have them with you. And if they would like to have a little bit more time to run around, they are also invited upstairs with you into the family room. So please do take advantage of that if you so choose. Good morning. All right. So today, I thought, since we have Pastor Mark here, isn't your name is Mark. Your name is Mark. Your name is Mark. Are there any other Marks? Any Marks online? I will give it a minute for the response, because I know there's a delay. No. Well, so we have Pastor Mark, and how many of you remember Pastor Mark from Zoom Church this last year? Yeah? Yeah. Can everybody say hi? But Pastor Mark, do you want to come? If you want. Sure. Okay, great. (laughs) Hey, welcome. And so I was going to talk about what a church leader looks like. Because right now, Pastor Mark and I are dressed differently. Can you guys see what's different about our two outfits? Yes, Evangeline. Um, we put on the robe and go on um, Easter and um, a suit and um, shoes. He, I'm wearing a robe and a stole, and he's wearing a suit and black shoes. Yeah. <laughs> what else do you see that's different? Yeah. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, okay, wonderful. And then, Maywin, do you have one? Okay. Um, you, you go. Are there any online, uh, Brian? Okay. So, what is it then that makes a church leader? Pastor Mark and I are dressed differently, but we're both church leaders. So, is it what we wear that makes us a leader? Yeah, Peter. Yeah, it's not what we wear that makes us a leader. Okay, so you know that Pastor Mark and I are leaders. Can you guys find other church leaders in this very room? Yeah. Basically everyone here. Oh, P. 
Peter. It's a good answer. Basically everyone here. What do you mean? Basically everyone. Everyone helps the church. Everyone helps the church. Yeah. Anybody else have, have anything they want to share? Can you give me one example of a, of a leader that's here today? Yeah, Mark. Like, uh, like, a, like a priest or something like that? Okay, so a, like a priest. Um, and so like Pastor Mark and I have a specific job that we do. We say prayers and we, and we, re, we do the sermon. Um, but what are some of the other examples of leaders here? Yeah, Emerson. Boom. Calder is a leader. Amen. All right. Who else? What other leaders do you see? You can get up and look around. They're everywhere. Some of them are over there in the corner. Choir. The choir are leaders. Yes, exactly. Anybody else? Do you see any other leaders? They're sneaky. Yeah, Mark. The people who are up there, they help with the toys and stuff like that? The people up there help with the toys. Yeah, and then parents. Parents are church leaders. Absolutely. Yes. Um, the people who work downstairs and right now are working together. Yeah. So Mr. Robert is a church leader. Amen. Amen. All right. And we've got elders here in the pews, and we even have you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So Emerson said that the kids are leaders too because they help with the church. So everybody is a leader in the church. So let us thank God that we can all be leaders and that we all have a place when we are following Jesus. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for this church and for all of the people who come and do good work. I thank you for the choir and for the pastors and for the parents and for the custodians and for the elders and for the visitors and for the caregivers and for choir and for the music director and for, oh my gosh, everybody and anybody else. <laughs> if I forgot you, you are included. Lord, thank you that all of us, all of us are called here and have a place here and a purpose. Uh, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, you can head back to your parents as we continue to worship.
please be seated. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading comes from the Psalms. Listen for God's word. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall loud your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty. And on your wondrous works, I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be pro proclaimed. And I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew. Listen for God's word. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon, and about three o'clock he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. 
Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, This last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus' ministry at this point in the gospel has moved from spectacle and curiosity to something more. People are recognizing that Jesus has something more than healing in his hands. He has something that is really valuable. More than that, Jesus seems to create value. The blind and the lame, the sick and the outcast, he calls them first. He places them first. The the rich and the self-righteous and the powerful, those who have traditionally held value, find themselves marginalized, clinging to their titles and their coins, but nothing more. Understandably, people are attracted to Jesus. They want value. They want to be valued. But they're thinking about value as if it is something that can be earned or acquired. They see Jesus as a means of getting good value. And so we begin to hear a certain kind of question being asked of him. His disciples ask, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Another follower asked, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Jesus' disciple Simon Peter asked, look, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? The mother of two other disciples came and asked, Declare that these two sons of mine will sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. These people recognize that what Jesus has is valuable. But what they don't understand is that this is a gift that is free. It cannot be bought or sold. It cannot be taken. It can only be given. And in the midst of all this clamoring to be the most valuable, Jesus tells this parable. We know it as the parable of the workers in the vineyard, but it starts in the marketplace. Jesus starts where the people are, in a world of goods traded and labor hired. Perhaps the crowd thinks it's about to get some insider tips on how to attain this new and improved value. This spiritual value, which is greater than any material value. Like the workers in the morning, the audience is eager to get started. And Jesus tells them that the kingdom of God is like a landowner who hired workers from the marketplace. He goes out in the morning to gather workers, then goes back at 9, and at noon, and at 3, and finally at 5. When he comes to the last, he asks them, why are you standing here? idle all day because no one has hired us they answer 
he sends these two to the vineyard. And when the day is over, the owner tells the manager to pay the workers in opposite order, from the last to the first. When I hear this story, I can't help but think of Home Depot. I've been there at the beginning of the day and seen groups of men standing around in the parking lot hoping to be hired. A truck pulls up, a finger points, and they climb in, completely at the mercy of the driver. And I've been there at the end of the day and seen the last few men standing, smoking in the fading sunlight, hoping for a last minute job. A job that could mean the difference between food on the plate or going hungry. The stakes are high. And there are always winners and losers in the marketplace. If the parable stopped here, where the workers were hired at 5 p.m., we might think that they are lucky, that they've been given an opportunity to work, even if just for an hour, which is more than nothing. It's a feel-good moment. You know, pity is shown on these last few. They may just get a fraction of the pay of the other workers, but they will be grateful. And it's probably really inconvenient for the landowner to come out this final time and hire them and take them to the vineyard, but man, he is a great guy. So generous. This would be an opportunity for us to pity those workers. But Jesus does not stop that parable there. The parable that begins in a marketplace ends in the vineyard. He flips our expectations. Those who only worked for an hour, he gives the full day's wage. The parable does not describe the feelings or inner thoughts of the group that worked for only one hour. But instead, we get a front row seat in the heads of the higher workers hired at the beginning of the day. We read, now when the first came, they thought they would receive more. They had witnessed the generosity of the landowner. There's no lack of money, it seems. Heck, this guy's giving money away. How generous will he be to those who have worked the longest? But then they get paid the same as everyone else. Even the ones that only worked for an hour. It's hard for me to read this passage and not automatically try to calculate who came out on top. Surely, it could be the workers who gained experience that day, working hard, networking, getting their full day's pay, but also getting valuable work experience. Or it could be the workers who sat around all day and worked for only an hour and got the full day's wage. Those guys who jumped up to work at dawn are the real losers. But calculating who came out on top means we fall into the same trap as the grumblers. Because we live in a world which tells us that our value is tied up in competition with others. It's a competitive system. There are winners and there are losers. The winners, the productive, the clever, successful, the lucky, come out on top, and the rest can catch the scraps. It's a selfish, zero-sum system. It's a system that says, my happiness and my success is predicated on another person's failure. We compete for jobs, for houses, for grades, for status, and this is not only accepted, this is celebrated. It's said that competition breeds innovation that is ultimately good for all of us. The winners win, and their winning helps us all. The losers lose, but get the benefit of living in the winner's improved world. We live in this world, and there's a danger that we think of this system as not only fair, but as moral, as a good. The meritocracy blessed by God, so that the ones who win deserve it and the ones who don't, don't. But this is how we end up in a country where Elon Musk is worth $209 billion and there are 37 million people living under the poverty line. And we call this unfortunate. 
but normal. Because when we celebrate this system, we can confuse dollar value with moral value. We can confuse worth with worthiness. And this is what Jesus is trying to push back on. He came not with a new way to win, but with a vision of life outside of the marketplace. He came to break the bonds of injustice and to lower the mountains and raise the valleys, but he also came to break a deeper curse. The lie that our value is found when it is measured over and against one another. In the parable, those hired at the beginning of the day, they grumble, you have made them equal to us. And just like the first workers, Peter and the disciples, they think that their great sacrifices in the name of Jesus will earn them top places in the kingdom. They're still thinking with the mind of the marketplace. It's an earthly way of thinking. And it ties our value to our productivity. It takes the miracle of our existence and it commodifies it. It monetizes it. It objectifies it. But in this system, of what worth is a child, or an elder, or the infirm, or the disabled? What worth is the stay-at-home parent or the weary woman caring for her aging father? What worth is the criminal, or the drug addict, the terminally ill, the unemployed or the unhoused. One might say that these people are worthless in that system. Children we can see as investments into future productivity, sure, and some of the others we can work to accommodate or rehabilitate in order to get them to produce. But the idea behind it is that you have no value if you do not contribute to the system. In this system, the poor are a problem to be managed, a group to receive charity and pity precisely because they have no value. And that is terrifying. Because for those of us who are in that system, it means we live with the fear that we are all one bad day away from worthless. But friends, Jesus comes and says, this is a lie. Jesus tells us that we are all worthy, not because of what we do, but because we are children of the living God. These workers had forgotten that they too were standing idle in the marketplace until they were called. They were, we are all equal in the eyes of God. We're called to live for one another. In God's kingdom, everyone gets enough. And everyone lives for each other. It's the opposite of competition. It's even beyond cooperation. It is, it is anti-competition. Jesus shows us what we are meant to be. To give and not to count the cost. And to love others, not because of what they can do, but simply because they are created to be loved. The system of the world says every man for himself. But the kingdom of heaven says there are many members, but one body. We hear Paul write to the church in Corinth, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. The parable of the workers radically confronts the competitive system that we live in and its values and exposes them as rotten. Not only do they lead to an unjust world, but they masquerade as a spiritual good. For the kingdom of God is not competitive, and it is not each for themselves. It is God for all and each for the other. 
There's not a meritocracy. It is not fair. Jesus comes for the saint and the sinner with a love that has nothing to do with what we do, but everything to do with who God is. And this kingdom is not just a future promise, but it is a world that we are called to work in and for right now. God calls us to the vineyard. And when we hear Jesus' call, and when we answer and look at one another without a thought for reward or worth, but just with the love that God shows, then we are no longer standing in the marketplace. But we are citizens of that good kingdom. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us continue to profess our faith in the words of the brief confession of faith as found in our bulletins. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation. Yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. Amen. You may be seated.
Week by week, we gather together to share our joys and concerns, trusting that God hears us. And so this day, you're invited to share your joys, and as you do so, uh, we will say, God, in your goodness, and I'll respond, here are, uh, we give you thanks. And with concerns, we'll say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please say your name when you're sharing, and if you're online, you're welcome to be sharing as well. Do you have a joy or a sh uh, concern to share this day? Yes, please, Betsy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Yes, I have one online uh, from Brenda Dunlap, prayers for, of healing for her sister, Erlene. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, in your goodness, receive our prayer. Brian. Uh, I'd like to offer a joy that Jim and Muriel have been able to join us in person today for the first time since we've been back. God, in your goodness, we give you, we give you thanks. <laughs> Please, Mary Beth. Uh, yes, I want to pray uh, for my friend Phil, who has gone from stage one congestive heart failure to stage two congestive heart failure, which is a, a significant drop in, in functionality. So pray for him. Uh, and his family. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Any other this day? I'd invite us all to take a deep breath. And rest in the presence of the living God. Let us pray. God, you are mercy upon mercy upon mercy upon mercy. And in the trials and the tribulations of our days, when we are sore pressed, O oh God, and loved ones and co-workers and fellow students are struggling so, remind us of your mercy. And so fill us with your mercy. that those around us will know you through us. We're bold to ask it. We ask, O oh God, in your love, make us love. In your light, shine through us. O oh God, be our salt and our savor so that we may be salt in this world and sweetness for those who need it. God, you are our healer and our restorer of joy. So we give you great thanks, O oh God, that we are able to worship together online and in person. Restorer of our joy, remind us, bring to our felt sense everything for which we have to be thankful. Enliven in us gratitude and gladness, we pray, so that we may emerge from worship this day rejoicing and live our lives as worship. 
God, we ask that you would hear our particular prayers this day with joy in being together, especially the children among us. The Jim and Muriel are here. We pray for Betsy's friend having the scan, and we pray for successful results on Tuesday. With Brenda Dunlap, we pray for her friend, We pray for the friend that has progressed in congestive heart failure, Phil, and we ask for his healing. And God, we pray for our fathers. We ask that you would bless them and heal their hearts, physically, spiritually, emotionally, And in the quiet of this moment, O oh God, we offer you our own place of greatest need and ask that you hear our prayer. Resting in you, O oh God, being restored and renewed by you, living Christ. Trusting that you fill us and abide with us, Holy Spirit. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us, his disciples, to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. While we are not passing the plate as traditional, um, there are many ways that you can give, and I thank you for the many ways that you have continued to give and support the work and the ministries of this church. Of course, this is financial uh, through sending a check in or by using Realm or the amazing technology that allows us to text our pledge, um, but also in the work that you do and the care that you have for this congregation. I give you thanks, uh, I thank you for all of the different ways that you are called to serve this congregation. And so let us stand and sing the doxology in thanksgiving. gifts to you. We offer our whole selves to you as you offered yourself in Jesus. Thank you for giving us generous hearts. Amen. Thanks. 
alert, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and let all that you do be done in love. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship and comfort of the Holy Spirit, and the love of God be with you this day and always. Amen.